with us already covering Tales from the Crypt, I figured we'd move on to another 90s TV show that focused on horror called Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction with host Jonathan Fricks. This show captivated audiences with its spine chilling stories, always blurring the line between reality and the paranormal. Well, anyway, let's get to it. Season one, episode two, the third segment titled The Kid in the Closet. A young boy named Danny Johnson is convinced that a monster lives in his bedroom closet. Danny's mother and older sister, Debbie, think that he just has an overactive imagination, while Danny's older brother, Brian, bullies him. Brian tells other children about Danny's fear, and together they torment and tease Danny. One day, Brian and his friends chase Danny home and drag him up to his bedroom, intending to throw him into the closet. Danny dares Brian to go into the closet instead, and Brian takes up the challenge. As soon as the closet door is closed, Brian begins banging on it while screaming for help and to be let out. But everyone except for Danny thinks that Brian is just acting. Brian suddenly goes silent just as Mrs. Johnson enters the room. When Mrs. Johnson opens the closet door, Brian is revealed to be gone without a trace, except for his clothing and shoes, which have been left in a crumpled pile on the floor. What? No way. What's this? That's Brian's shirt. Where'd he go? Who? Brian, he went into the closet. He's gone. I told you there's a monster in there. The police are called and search the closet, but they find no clues as to what could have happened to Brian, who was never seen or heard from again. Excuse me, Mrs. Johnson, I need to speak to my partner. I couldn't hear exactly what the police were saying to each other, but I guessed what the report would read. My son Brian would be officially listed as a missing person, another young boy who ran away from home. It's really weird. The kid just seems to have vanished into thin air. What do you want me to write in the report? That the kid was eaten by a monster? He's gone? I told you there was a monster in there. Could the idea for a story like this have come from a real life event? Yes, it did. Also in season one, episode two, but segment two titled The Subway. The Larkin couple Ann and Al go out for a night on the town and board a subway train, not noticing that there is no one else on the platform. The subway cars are also all empty, except for a man who is wearing odd formal attire. The man in the tuxedo was just the start of the strange things that we would experience that night. The train begins skipping stops and accelerating out of control. And when the Larkins ask the other passenger what is going on, the latter tells them that this train goes nowhere before disappearing. Um, excuse me, does this train go to Melrose? This train goes nowhere. The train eventually starts going backwards. I couldn't believe it. The train seemed to actually be coming to a stop. I was just praying with all of my heart that the doors would open. The Larkins are shaken and decide to just go home. As they are making their way back to their apartment, they smell gas coming from the unit of one of their neighbors, Mrs. Ewing. It was our next door neighbor's apartment. Mrs. Ewing! Mrs. Ewing, it's me, Anne! Watch, Mrs. Watch, Ewing! Watch, watch, I got this. Mrs. Ewing! Mrs. Ewing! Okay. Maybe we should call the soup. Well, there isn't time! Okay. And then I remembered the key. Wait, 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 the key! The key! Oh, the key. Yeah. The chain! Mrs. Ewing! Oh, I got it, I got it. The Larkins break down Mrs. Ewing's door, turn off the gas, and save her. While Mrs. Ewing is recovering, Anne notices an old photograph of her and the man from the train. Mrs. Ewing identifies this man as her husband, Edward, who died decades ago. Delighted. <coughs> Maybe we should take you to the emergency room. No, 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 I'm all right. 
I'm just lucky you two smelled the gas. Mrs. Ewing, who is this? Why? That's Edward, my husband. He passed away 29 years ago. He said he'd always watch over me. We were looking at the same man we saw on the train. He said he'd never leave me. Promising that he would always watch out for her and keep her safe. It is possible that Edward appeared as a spirit and made the train go back in order for the Larkins to save his widow's life. Would it surprise you to learn that this story was inspired by an actual experience? It was. In our third spot, the lady in a black dress. Anne Ross's aunt, Lillian, passed away all alone in a nursing home. Anne was unable to take Lillian in or be by her side when she died, leaving her with lingering guilt. This feeling is especially strong because the last time she saw Lillian, her aunt had taken her aside and said the most important thing in the world to her was having someone she loved by her side when she passed. Five years after Lillian's death, Anne is out shopping for dresses with her daughter, Julie, who has been invited to a childhood friend's wedding. Anne keeps catching glimpses of a woman who looks strikingly like her Aunt Lillian and begins to smell her distinctive perfume throughout the store. Do you smell that? What, flowers? No, no, it's, it's Aunt Lillian's perfume that she used to wear. However, neither Julie nor the sales clerk see the woman or smell the perfume. Julie doesn't find a suitable dress, and as she changes out of the one she tried on, Anne steps outside to bring the car around and meets an unfortunate fate. Oh my God. Someone call an ambulance! Someone get her daughter. She's in the changing room, hurry! As motorists and bystanders rush to her aid, the fatally wounded Anne sees Lillian. Lillian reassures her saying, I will not let you die alone. It is very important that the last thing you see is the face of love. It's very important. The last thing you see is the face of love. Tragically, Anne dies just seconds before her daughter reaches her side. It's a chilling tale that reminds us fate rarely calls upon us at a time of our choosing, and to live your life to the fullest every day. Excuse me, the elderly lady that was just here, did you see where she went? I'm sorry, I didn't see anyone. Really? The, that perfume, it's so strong right here. If you thought a similar story to this one actually happened, you're right. It's fact. According to first-hand interviews conducted by author Robert Trailers. In season three, episode four, segment three titled Dead Friday, Jody and her boyfriend Marcus have set up a blind date between Jody's roommate Miranda and Marcus's friend Keith. The four of them plan on going to a nightclub before returning to Jody and Miranda's to watch a rented horror film called Dead Friday, in celebration of it being Friday the 13th. Jody places the film in her VCR and then goes to the door to let in Marcus and Keith. As Jody introduces her to Keith, Miranda is distracted by the television. Oh my god. Everyone oh. thought I was crazy, but. The images it is showing distorted and disturbing clips of a train, the four of them. The television just looks like it is turned off to Jody, Marcus, and Keith, who assume that Miranda is acting up to get out of going on the double date. Miranda refuses to leave, convinced that something terrible will happen if she does, and begs everyone else to stay. You can't go! None of us can go! Okay, she's completely wacko. All right, I'm out of here. No! You can't go! Don't you understand? There's something wrong! Which Jody reluctantly agrees to do. This annoys Marcus, who leaves with Keith. Jody is angry at Miranda, but while watching a newscast a few hours later, she is shocked when a reporter mentions that Marcus and Keith were killed when their car stalled at a railroad crossing. Stalled out on Miranda, the you gotta see this! Come quick! Two young men reportedly spent the evening dancing at the popular club Madame Q's before heading for home. Repeating once again, two young men are dead in a car collision with a train. This is Patricia McCovey. Marcus and Keith. Miranda. You saved my life. 
where they were hit by a train. Jody alerts Miranda to the newscast, and together the two inspect their rented copy of Dead Friday, which turns out to be an empty VHS rental box with nothing inside. Was this story of a fateful Friday the 13th based on a real incident? Yes, it was. And finally, an episode that still disturbs me. The segment titled, The Mirror of Truth, from Season 3, Episode 13. We visit the home of Jocelyn Marshall. Jocelyn claims to have been so hideously disfigured that she can no longer even go outside. And when the surgeon asks what happened to her, Jocelyn mentions that it all started when she visited a beauty salon owned by a woman named Nicole. Whatever you wish. So, what's the occasion? My boyfriend plans to propose to me this afternoon. What a lucky man. Yes, he is. Jocelyn wanted a makeover before a proposal dinner with her fiance, Ron, and was attended to by Nicole herself. As Nicole was working on Jocelyn, Jocelyn made numerous conceited remarks about herself. Never met anyone who truly appreciated me. Okay, now I'll finish the eyes. Close them, please. Oh, don't overdo them. I won't. My eyes are among my best features. And once the makeover was finished, Jocelyn freaked out over it being dreadful, even though she barely looked any different. I can't believe I've been here all this time. Oh my god. Oh my god, what have you done to me? I look awful. No. You look fantastic. Gorgeous. Are you kidding me? I look better when I walked in here. Okay. Um, calm down. I can I can redo it. I I, I can I can make it any way that you want. Just forget it. You're totally inept. You wasted my time. You expect me to waste more time while you attempt to fix this mess? And began insulting and threatening Nicole. Nicole, angered by Jocelyn's behavior proceeded to curse her with the mirror of your soul. How dare you threaten me in my own shop? You're, you're shallow and you're, you're self-absorbed. I curse you. I curse you with the mirror of your soul. Jocelyn stormed out of the salon, returned home, washed all of Nicole's makeup and applications off, and then had dinner with Ron. Instead of proposing to Jocelyn, Ron broke up with her. And when Jocelyn asked why, Ron remarked that it was because... It's just that I've noticed some qualities in you that I'd never seen before. You've changed. I'm sure it was then that the curse began. Look me in the face and tell me you don't love me anymore. That night, after Ron left, Jocelyn looked into one of her mirrors and was horrified to discover that she had been rendered hideous by Nicole's curse. Jocelyn tried to call Nicole to beg her to remove the curse, only to learn that the salon had closed for the summer and would not reopen until after Labor Day. This is Nicole's salon. We're on vacation for the summer. See you after Labor Day. You can leave a message at the beat. Oh, no. No, you can't be closed. This is Jocelyn Marshall. Jocelyn was never able to get back in touch with Nicole, and nothing that she applied to her face helped to hide the disfigurements that were caused by Nicole's curse. When the surgeon finally examines Jocelyn's face, he tells Jocelyn that there is nothing that he can do for her, as it is revealed that Jocelyn looks completely normal, and only sees herself as a monster in reflective surfaces. I'm sorry, but... There's nothing I can see that can be done for you. I'm horrible. Why can't you help me? In your case, I'm afraid that plastic surgery is not an option. This segment is particularly disturbing because it delves into the psychological horror of self-perception. The idea that one's mind can distort reality and create such terrifying visions forces us to confront our own insecurities, and it shows a horrifying visual representation of the mental disorder known as body dysmorphia. This story of a tortured soul is based on an actual experience that happened near the Florida Gulf Stream area. 
And that wraps up our exploration of my top five disturbing but true segments from Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Take care, have a good weekend, stay safe, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. And the third segment called The Kid in the Closet. It's kind of a messed up title. I mean, am I wrong about that? I think it's kind of messed up. <laughs> oh, shit. Miranda refuses to leave, convinced that something will happen if she does. I mean, not for nothing, though. I'd, I'd probably stay there with Jody. Is that okay? Can I say that? <laughs> oh, God. That's still, that's still horrible to look at. It's like she has Slimer's disease or garbage pail kiditis. Ah, uh, no.